Hello and welcome back everybody. In the last video we have illustrated the basics with the help of an example and now it's time to dive in a bit deeper and look at a bit more technical aspects of the metropolis hastings method. Let's come back to the theory. What we've seen in the example was that if we follow the metropolis hastings algorithm that we are really able to create a Markov chain where the Markov chain has stationary distribution pi. And we are able to choose pi, so using that algorithm, we can generate Markov chains with whatever stationary distribution we like. And I've hinted at this, what we will use later is that the algorithm actually has a bit stronger property, namely that the distribution of xj converges to pi. You will see that, let's write L of xj for the distribution of xj, L stands for law, converges to pi as j goes to infinity and that will mean that for large j the xj will be nearly distributed according to pi and in our Monte Carlo estimates then the majority of samples you want for large j will be very close to what we need namely we need samples with distribution pi because pi is the distribution of x. So that's just looking ahead so for now Let's just check the first statement. Why does the Markov chain have stationary distribution pi? So I put that in brackets because it's for the future. For now, we just worry about the stationary distribution. And in the book, there are two separate proofs for that statement, one for the continuous case and one for the discrete case. Here we'll just go through the proof for the discrete case, which is in section 4.1.2. And I'll leave it to you to read section 4.1.1, which gives a proof for the continuous case. As before, you can guess, these two proofs are very similar and the differences are mostly notational with densities replacing probability vectors and with integrals replacing sums. So I show you one of the proofs, you read the other one yourself. I actually do a slightly more elaborate proof for the discrete case and prove a slightly simpler statement for the continuous case you will see when you look at the book. So for the discrete case we first consider something which is called the detailed balance condition. So x satisfies the detailed balance condition if there is a probability vector pi such that pi x pxy equals pi of y pyx for all x and y in the state space S. And here p as before is the transition matrix and little pxy are the elements of the transition matrix. So that condition involves the probability of going from x to y on the left and from y to x on the right. And there is no reason these two should be equal, but there is a relation between the two which sometimes holds and sometimes doesn't, and that is sometimes pi of x pxy equals pi of y pyx for some vector pi, and if that holds, then we say the Markov chain satisfies the detailed balance condition. And the reason that this is important is the following lemma, so that's lemma 4.6 in the book, which says if x satisfies the detailed balance condition, then pi is the stationary distribution. So let me just write that here. If x satisfies the detailed balance condition with a certain probability vector pi, then sometimes one says x is pi reversible. That's just another way to say the same thing. The advantage of this notation is that we have a place where we can state what is pi. Good. So the lemma says if x is pi reversible, then pi is a stationary distribution of x. Before we prove that, let's just remember what does it mean to be a stationary distribution. So this we did in section 2.3 of the book, an earlier video, and here we see the condition pi is a stationary distribution of x if p transpose pi equals pi, or equivalently if we transpose the equation pi transpose p equals pi transpose. And written component-wise, what we need to check is that if we just write pi here without the time t plus 1, that pi x equals some y in s, p y x, pi of y. That's what we will need to check. So let's switch back to our current section. We need to show pi of y equals sum over all x, pi of x, p, x, y. 
So to try that, we start on the right hand side. So we have sum x in s, pi of x plus y equals something. And the first thing we can do is we can use the detailed balance condition because it says if x is pi reversible, the statement holds, and pi reversible we saw here means pi x p x y equals pi y p y x. So pi x p x y we can replace with pi y p y x by the detailed balance condition. Then the next step is we see pi y does not depend on x, it depends on y. That was the benefit of swapping the two. So we can take it out of the sum. So we get pi y times sum x in s p y x. And now we use the fact that P is a transition matrix. So the elements added over rows add up to one. Y is fixed, that's the row index, and X goes over all columns. So that here is the sum along row Y. So that is pi of Y times one, which equals pi of Y. And if you check up here, this is what we are meant to show. So this proof is complete. And I spoke about the role of proofs for a bit. So that proof, it can be understood what's going on if you think a bit more deeply about how Markov chains work. But what we did here was we just manipulated the symbol. So that chain here is just for us a mean to check that the relation holds. And also this definition one can understand if one thinks about things a bit more deeply. But here what we did is we just looked it up on some old slides and remember that was what we need to check for stationary distribution. But even without getting an intuition for the details here, we can verify that this is true. So we have assumed x is pi reversible, we use this here, and we have shown first this sum equals pi of y. Then on the previous slide, we checked that condition means pi is a stationary distribution, and so we have reached the conclusion. So don't worry if you don't have any intuition about this, that proof is easy enough, I would say, that even without intuition, you can probably reconstruct that from memory even after a long time, if only you remember what is pi reversible and what is pi, what does it mean for pi to be a stationary distribution. Good. So now we are in a position to tackle the statement I promised. Namely, I promised that the Markov chain constructed by the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm will have stationary distribution pi. And here we saw being pi reversible is even stronger, namely it implies that pi is a stationary distribution. And here we will show this slightly stronger statement just because it's just as easy. And we will show that the output of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is pi reversible, that applies what we need. When you are going to read the section about the proof for the continuous case, there you will see pi reversible has some technical problems. I'm not doing it, so there I'm only showing the stationary distribution, which makes the proof slightly simpler. You don't need to do the step we have just done, but it is still very similar. Good. So the statement we are going to prove, that is proposition 4.7, this says the output of the metropolis Hastings algorithm is pi reversible. And the proof has some steps, but again, it's not very difficult. So we can just do that now. In the proof, the only thing we need to be a bit careful about is notation. Namely, in the algorithm, we have a Markov chain, that is this x, which is constructed in the run of the algorithm. And we have a transition matrix, but these do not belong together. Namely, p is the transition matrix we use for the proposals. But then there is this accept reject step, so p is not the transition matrix of x. So that's the only potentially confusing step. So we need a separate name for the transition matrix of p. So let q be the transition matrix of x. And that will depend on p and will depend on the accept reject mechanism. And as usual, I want to denote the elements of q by lowercase letters q, x, y, where x and y are states. So what do we have? We have q x y equals, well, it's the transition matrix, so that is the probability of x j plus 1 being y if x j was equal to x for all x y in the state space and all times j in n0. Now we need to show the detailed balance condition, which means the process is pi reversible, and in terms of q, we can now write this as follows. We need to show pi of 
x and now the transition matrix is q so we write q x y equals pi of q q y x for all states so that's what we need to do using this notation and first there is a important special case namely if x equals y we don't need to do anything so let me just write that in red if x equals y we need to show pi x q x x equals pi x q x x and well it's the same thing so that is clear so we have nothing to do for x equals y the detailed balance condition always holds if x equals y so we can assume x is different from y and that makes a difference namely q x y is the probability of the process capital x being at little x at one step and at little y at the next step and so we see if x is different from y we cannot have rejected if x is different from y that means we must have accepted and we must have proposed y so for working out what is q x y if y is different from x again we need to first propose y here and then we need to accept so that we actually make the jump that's the only way to get from one state to another if the states are different so in this case q x y is the product of two things first we need to propose y and given in state x the probability of that happening is p x y this is here the probability given that x j minus one was x going to y is p x y and then we multiply to this the probability of accepting y but we had a name for that that's what we called alpha so let's just write that the first term is the probability of proposing little y and the second term is the probability of accepting and that is how we can go from x to y if x and y are different from each other good then the next step is to plug in alpha so we know that pxy times the minimum and we now just need to remember what alpha was it's pi of y pyx divided of pi of x pxy minimum with one and that is copied straight from here so that's what we get and now let me write that in blue what we really want to look at is pi of x qxy so we have pi of x qxy is pi of x pxy times alpha is pi of x pxy times the minimum and so on and you see something happens here namely we can take pi of x pxy inside the minimum we have to multiply this to both terms so we have pi of x pxy times this fraction pi of y pyx pi of x pxy and we have pi of x pxy times one and here the denominator is cancelled so what we get is just minimum of pi of y pyx and pi of x pxy good now let's look back what we need to show that has already simplified a bit we want to show pi of x q x y equals pi of y q y x so what we really need to show is the value does not change if we swap x and y so it's symmetric in x and y that's really what we do and that is trivial here namely the minimum i can swap over so that equals minimum and i just swap the term so i write the second term first and first term second pi of y p by x let's have arrows just to show how that happens and now you can either argue clearly it is symmetric in x and y because we can do what we have just done or you can do the steps backwards but either way you come up at the point that this whole thing equals also pi of y q y x and that's what we were meant to show we have pi of x q x y equals pi of y q y x which was what i said we should show and that completes the proof so let's draw a little end of proof box here and i already said why we did this once we have established that's true well we have just shown it's pi reversible then we can conclude that pi is a stationary distribution of x and that is really what we wanted here good so that is the theoretical main result and it just tells us that the steps of these algorithms really work 
if we follow these steps, we get a Markov chain. I didn't talk about this, but it is trivial because every xj is only directly or indirectly computed from the previous xj, so there cannot be any hidden dependencies on past states because everything is channeled through this or that point. And we have just shown the Markov chain is pi reversible, so it has stationary distribution pi. Now, going backwards, our aim is now to plug in the Markov chain here. And then we hope that if we compute the Monte Carlo estimate as usual, but now with the Markov chain in here, that we still get an estimate for the expectation of f of x. And one of the next steps will be to argue that not only do we have the distribution of x as the stationary distribution, but we actually converge to this stationary distribution. Then xj will get closer and closer to samples from the distribution of x, and we can still converge. And the other thing we need to do is there is no chance these samples will be independent. So we need to think about the error. That's a bit similar to what we do when we did the antithetic variables method. There we already had a Monte Carlo estimate where the variables were dependent on each other in a limited way. And a similar argument will appear here, and autocorrelations between the different xj will play a role again. But I'll leave that for another video. So, thank you all for watching. This completes our coverage of the general Metropolis Hastings method. And in the next three videos, which form kind of a mini series on their own, we will discuss important special cases of this algorithm. So, goodbye for now.